Lesson 33, Review. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Lenny's Latin class. Today we're on Lesson 33 on page 99. This particular lesson is special because it's a review lesson. And so what we have here in the textbook is a series of review questions. And then we have some review of vocabulary. And then we have a passage from Caesar's Gallic Wars. This is a recorded lecture series, so there's no need for me to review all the questions in section 269. If you have questions about any of those items, you can simply go back to the lecture that covers that particular item and listen to it again. And the same thing goes for section 270, the vocabulary, and for section 271. Because in section 271, the exercises are taken exactly from previous lessons. They are identical to the ones we've already covered. For example, number 13 is about the boy E living across the Rhine. We just covered that in the previous lesson. So we're going to skip 269, 270, and 271. What is new, however, is the new section from Caesar's Gallic Wars. That's section 272. But before we do that, there's another topic that I would like to cover. And I thought that this particular lesson would be a good place to do it because there's not much else to talk about besides the new passage from Caesar's Gallic Wars. And the topic I want to cover in the first part of this particular lecture is the topic of accent in Latin. That is, figuring out what syllable receives the accent in a Latin word. Throughout this course, I have tried to pronounce everything exactly correctly according to the rules of Latin accentuation. I try to always be a good example of the way Latin is supposed to sound, because if you're listening to this lecture series, basically I'm your teacher and I need to set a good example. I need to do things right so that you don't get wrong information. So I've tried to maintain good pronunciation habits. I may make a mistake every now and then, but I've generally tried to pronounce things correctly. What I have not done is teach you something about Latin accent. We've talked about uh, long vowels and short vowels a little bit, and we've talked about diphthongs. So we've discussed a few things that pertain to the linguistics, and the pronunciation of Latin. But we have not really jumped into the topic of accent. That is, figuring out what syllable receives the accent in a Latin word. You might call it accentuation. And honestly, I've kind of avoided it up to this point for several reasons. First of all, the way accentuation is taught in Latin is problematic. The fact of the matter is, is that many teachers teach it in a way that is at best unhelpful, and at worst, it's just simply wrong and actually teaching misinformation. So when Latin teachers teach Latin accentuation incorrectly, it's not because they're intending to do it incorrectly, or they're not trying to deceive anyone. It's just that that's the way they've been taught. That's the way they learned it. And so they're just repeating what they've learned and what they're accustomed to. So what I would like to do in this particular lecture is tell you good, reliable, solid ways that you can help yourself understand Latin accentuation. And this reminds me of one of the reasons why I have avoided talking about this topic for so long, and that is that you can't really teach Latin accent apart from other things. When you teach someone how to do accent in Latin, it brings up a couple of other related issues. One of them is long and short syllables. Another is long and short vowels. And another is syllabification. Now, in Latin, the place where you really end up studying this stuff most of the time is when you do Latin poetry. Latin poetry is written in certain rhythmic patterns known as meters. 
one poet might write a poem with a, a certain meter, another poet might write a poem that has a different meter. And what I mean here is the pattern of long and short syllables. We have poetic meters in English too. For example, uh, William Shakespeare used to write in iambic pentameter. Each line of poetry, we call that a line, and then each part of the poetic meter, we call that a foot. Okay, so iambic pentameter has five sections known as feet, and each section is called an iamb. I-A-M-B is how you spell it. So an iamb consists of a short syllable and a long syllable. By the way, pentameter, the word penta is Greek for five. So pentameter, that word literally means five measures or five feet. So if you have iambic pentameter, that means a rhythmic scheme consisting of five feet in which the feet are iams. Iambic pentameter is easy to recognize It has a certain lilting kind of sound to it, like uh, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. Of course, the way I just pronounced that is not very nice sounding. I simply did that to accentuate the meter. So my point here is that poems are written in certain rhythmic meters. In Latin, the most commonly found one is called dactylic hexameter. So when you read poetry in Latin, when you study poetry, part of the study of it is to study the poetic meter, to figure out which syllables are long, which ones are short, to get the sound of the poetry. When you say the longs and the shorts uh, in their proper places, in the proper sequence, the poetry starts to sing. It starts to have a musical sound to it. So in this particular lecture series, we are studying not poetry, but prose. Prose, P-R-O-S-E, is just regular running text. It's not written in any kind of poetic meter. However, the same rules that we use for figuring out accents and long syllables and short syllables and syllabification, all those same rules that we learn when we study Latin poetry, all those rules still apply to any Latin, and it's helpful to know them. So, in spite of the fact that we're not studying poetry, I would still like to say a few things about those kinds of rules, just for your knowledge, so you can know what's going on, and to help contextualize how we figure out accent in Latin. In Latin classes, this material is often taught poorly, and it's Unfortunately, sometimes taught with actual misinformation. I'll say a few more words about that later. But for right now, what I want to do is just tell you what I think is the best and most reliable way to learn about these issues. Issues that relate to long and short syllables, you know, figuring out the length of syllables, scanning poetry, thinking about poetic meter, and figuring out which syllable gets an accent. All this stuff is connected. And so what I'm going to do now is tell you the best way to start into this topic. When you are studying Latin, whether it's syllable length, scansion of poetry, looking for where to put the accent, any of those topics, the best way to start is with syllabification. And what I mean is, is the first thing you need to do is figure out what comprises a syllable. You need to figure out how to determine the borderline between one syllable and the next syllable. So syllabification means you're dividing a word up into syllables. And you have to figure out where one syllable ends and the next syllable begins. So that really is the key that unlocks scansion and accent for a Latin student. So when it comes to accent, when it comes to long syllables and short syllables, that's the place you start is syllabification. You figure out the skill of dividing a Latin word into syllables. Okay, that's the ground floor. That's the foundation of it all. Then as you figure out what the syllables are, then you can start to think about 
a very important issue called open and closed syllables. Okay, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Also, you can talk about vowel length, and you can think about if a syllable contains a long vowel or if it contains a short vowel. Also, you can keep in mind that a syllable and the vowel contained by that syllable may not be the same length. So at this point, you might be starting to understand why I have avoided this topic for so long, because it's a little bit complex. Once you learn it, it's really not complex at all. It's actually quite simple once you understand the basics. In fact, I would argue that the syllable-based way of doing scansion and figuring out accent is much easier than the other set of rules that you are taught sometimes. In fact, uh, a personal note here, I never understood scansion and accent until I understood syllabification and open and closed syllables. And so that's what I'm going to teach you today. So we're going to start out with syllabification, that is dividing up a Latin word into syllables, and then that's going to give us a foundation, and we'll go on from there into the other parts of the discussion. And by the time we're done, hopefully you'll have a good idea of how all this works. A quick note, the rules of how we do syllabification in Latin are a little bit different from how it's done in English. In English, there are certain rules about dividing words up into syllables that are done differently than Latin. If you've already studied this in English, you might need to forget some of what you know Sometimes in English, we divide up syllables based on sound units, not so much consonants and vowels. But a good general statement to keep in mind is that the number of syllables in a word is the same as the number of vowel sounds in the word. The number of vowel sounds in a word, that's going to be the same as the number of syllables in the word. So the first thing we want to do here is learn how to divide up Latin words into syllables. That's syllabification. And just to get us started, I'm going to use English words to do it. We're going to apply the the rules of how we do it in Latin, but I'm going to use English words just for the sake of familiarity. So here's a good place to start. A good place to start is the idea that in Latin, a syllable is usually going to start with a consonant. Not always. Sometimes a syllable can start with a vowel. But a lot of the time it's going to start with a consonant. So let's start there as just kind of a starting point. And let's look at a few English words just for practice. And uh, I would recommend that you get out a piece of paper or a notebook and something to write with because this is kind of an interactive lecture. Let's start with the word banana. B-A-N-A-N-A. And let's start out by dividing this word up into syllables. First of all, let's figure out how many syllables it has. Banana. As we say the word, it becomes clear that it has three vowel sounds. So it has three syllables. So how do we divide it up? It starts with a B, and then we have the letter A, and then we have an N. If we were going to draw a line between the first two syllables, where would we draw the line? So in Latin, the idea is that each new syllable is going to start with a consonant. Our first syllable here, if this were a Latin word, would be B-A, and then we have the letter N starting the next syllable. So ba is the first syllable. You could draw a line between the A and the N, and then na is the second syllable. And then at the end, we have another consonant, the letter N, starting yet another syllable. So ba, na, na. Those are the three syllables. In this case, each one is starting with a consonant. So it's a very easy word to divide into syllables. Each of the syllables in this word has a consonant-vowel pattern. Consonant-vowel, consonant-vowel, consonant-vowel. If this were a Latin word, it would just be really easy to divide up. Let's try another one. Let's try the word karate, K-A-R-A-T-E. Based on what you know from our previous study of the word banana, 
how would you divide this word up into syllables? Would the first syllable be K-A, Ka, or would it be Kar? Would you include the R there? The answer is that the letter R is going to start the second syllable. So K-A is the first syllable, then you could draw a line between the A and the R. And the second syllable would be Ra, R-A. And the final syllable would be the T and the E. So Karate, or Karate. We're not really pronouncing it probably with the right Japanese pronunciation, but you get the idea. Let's move on to a slightly more complicated one. Let's look at the word tulip. T-U-L-I-P. How would you divide it into syllables? Well, the first syllable would be the T and the U. And then the second syllable would start with the consonant. That's the letter L. So two is the first syllable. Lip is the second syllable. Again, after that first syllable, T-U, the next syllable starts with a consonant. Very important rule. When you get to the consonant, that's when you start a new syllable. Let's do a slightly harder one. Let's do the word amoral. That's spelled A-M-O-R-A-L. Amoral. How would you divide that word into syllables? Would the first syllable be just the A? Or would it be A and M together? Am? Remember our rule. When you get to a consonant, that's when you're going to start a new syllable. So here, the letter A is going to be a syllable all by itself. A or A, depending on how you pronounce it, that's the first syllable. Then when you get to the letter M, you're starting a new syllable. So if you're doing syllabification, draw a line between the A and the M. So A is the first one. Mo is the second one, the M and the O. Then when you get to the R, you're starting yet another syllable. So a mo ral. If that were a Latin word, that's how we would divide it into syllables. Keep in mind that that first syllable doesn't have a consonant sound starting it. There's no consonant there to start off the sound of the letter A. The A is just sitting there by itself. So sometimes you see that as uh, in the word amoral. Now let's move on to some slightly more challenging words that will help us learn a new concept. Let's look at the word admit. Admit is spelled A-D-M-I-T. How do we divide that word into syllables? How many syllables does it have? Admit. It sounds to me like it has two syllables. So what are our choices? We could say that the A is by itself at the beginning, and then the second syllable is D-M-I-T, admit. And that doesn't really make sense. We could say ad is a syllable, and then mit is a syllable. Or we could say adm is a syllable, and then it is the next syllable, adam it. That doesn't really make sense. Here's the answer, is that we would draw the line between the D and the M. So ad is the first syllable, and then mit is the second syllable. So the challenge there in that word is that we have two consonants next to each other. So if you know that a consonant is supposed to start the next syllable, that's why you have to be able to divide them into syllables. You have to know syllabification because, as I'll teach you in a moment, the way we divide up a word into syllables is related to the length of the syllables and uh, to accent. Let's try another one. Let's try the word upset. Okay, U-P-S-E-T. Here we have two consonants in a row again. So how do we divide it into syllables? Okay, the key here is you're going to divide the syllables between the two consonants. So up will be one syllable, and then set will be another syllable. Now the next thing that I need to talk about is the idea of open and closed syllables. Okay, when you study Latin, you find that words have open syllables or closed syllables. Here's the basic rule. An open syllable is a syllable that ends with a vowel sound. A closed syllable is a syllable that ends with a consonant. Okay, so let's look at a few of the words we've studied so far 
and let's see if we can identify open and closed syllables. Let's go back for a moment to the word banana. The first syllable is B-A, the second one is N-A, and the third syllable is N-A. Remember that an open syllable ends with a vowel sound, a closed syllable ends with a consonant. So would you say the syllables in this word are open or closed? The answer is that they're all open. Ba is an open syllable, na is an open syllable, and then the other na at the end is an open syllable. They all have that consonant vowel pattern. So banana is a word that consists of three open syllables. Likewise, karate has three open syllables. Ka, ra, and te, they're all open. They all end with a vowel sound. Let's try the word tulip again, T-U-L-I-P. Would you say these uh, syllables are open or closed? The first syllable is T-U, two. That ends with a vowel. What about the syllable lip? Okay, now we're encountering your first closed syllable. Okay, the syllable starts with an L, and then it has a vowel in the middle, that's the letter I, and then it ends with the letter P, which is a consonant. So the syllable L-I-P, lip, is a closed syllable. T-U, two, is open, lip is closed. How about the word amoral? Are these open or closed? Well, the first syllable, A, is an open syllable because it ends with a vowel or vowel sound. The second syllable is M-O, mo. That's an open syllable because it ends with a vowel. The third syllable, R-A-L, that's a closed syllable because it ends with the letter L. That's a consonant. R-A-L, ral, is a closed syllable. So we have two open syllables and then a closed syllable. Let's look again at the word admit, A-D-M-I-T. Now put on your thinking cap for a minute. Are these syllables open or closed? The answer is that both of the syllables in the word admit are closed syllables. If this were a Latin word, you would divide it between the D and the M. The first syllable is ad, the second syllable is mit. In fact, this word comes from Latin, ad mito. So the first syllable is a, d. So that d there closes the syllable. It ends with a consonant, and so ad is a closed syllable. Then the second syllable, mit, mit, that's also closed because it ends with the letter t, which is a consonant. What about upset? Same thing. U and P makes the first syllable, and then S-E-T is the second syllable. Again, you have two consonants next to each other, the P and the S. You divide the syllables between those two consonants, and that leaves you with up, that's a closed syllable that ends with a consonant, and then set, that's yet another closed syllable that ends with a consonant. So the letter P and the letter S, that's the border between syllables. The P is closing the previous syllable. The letter S is starting the next syllable. What about the word subtract? Another good word with Latin roots. Subtract, S-U-B-T-R-A-C-T. So let's do syllabification, that is divided into syllables, and then tell me if the syllables are open or closed. In this particular word, we have three consonants in a row. We have B, T, and R. But here's a quick tip. There's a rule about this. The letter R is considered a liquid. It's kind of a smooth-sounding letter. It's not a hard sound like T or P. It's a smooth sound with flowing air, R. So the T and the R join together, and they count as one sound. So the way we divide this word up is between the B and the T. Sub is the first syllable, and then tract is the second syllable. Okay, so the border between syllables is between the B and the T. You could draw a line between those two letters. Okay, so sub is a closed syllable because it ends with a consonant. Tract 
is a closed syllable because it ends really with two consonants. So when you're looking at the B and the T next to each other, and you're thinking about how to divide up the syllables, keep in mind that the letter B is closing the previous syllable, the letter T is starting the next syllable. Same thing with double consonants, like the word rabbit. Try it with the word rabbit, R-A-B-B-I-T. How would you divide it up? Okay, you would put the border between syllables here, between the two Bs. R-A-B is the first syllable, and B-I-T is the second syllable. Now, figure out if the syllables are open or closed. What about the first syllable? The first syllable ends with a B, which is a consonant. That means it's a closed syllable. The second syllable, B-I-T, that also ends with a consonant, so that's a closed syllable too. So the word rabbit consists of two closed syllables, but a word like banana consists only of open syllables. Again, we're treating these words as if they are Latin words, applying the rules of Latin syllabification just for practice. We're not treating them as if they were English words applying the rules of English syllabification. The point I want you to see here in this section of the lecture is that when you have two consonants in a row, you're going to divide the syllables between those two consonants, and the first consonant will end the previous syllable. The second consonant will start the next syllable. So now you know about syllabification, you know how to divide a word into syllables, and you know about open and closed syllables. So now let's move on and talk about the next thing we need to discuss when you want to figure out what syllable receives the accent in Latin. And so the next thing that you need to be able to do is identify the different syllables in a word by counting backward from the end of the word. In Latin, the accent can only fall on certain syllables. And so to figure out what those syllables are, we have to count backward from the end. So the last syllable in a word has a special name. In fact, each of the last three syllables, each one has a special name. So in a word, the last syllable is referred to as the ultima, U-L-T-I-M-A. The second to last syllable is called the penult. That's P-E-N-U-L-T. And the third syllable from the end is called the antipenult. That's A-N-T-E-P-E-N-U-L-T. So these are weird words. Where do they come from? Why do we call the syllables by these weird words? The answer is that these words come from Latin. In Latin, the word ultima is a first and second declension adjective, ultimus, ultima, ultimum, and it means something like last or farthest. Okay, so we call the last syllable in a word the ultima because that's what it means in Latin. The word ultima means last. The next to last syllable, again, is called the penult. And that's a cut down version of two Latin words. One is the word pine, that's P A E N E, and pine means almost. So if you put pine and ultima together, you get almost last. So the next to last syllable is almost last. It's not the last, but it's almost last. And so that's in Latin, pine ultima. And so when those words get squished together, it becomes the word penult. The I-M-A, for some reason, they go away from the end of the word ultima. In the word pine, the A goes away. And we just have P-E-N. The E at the end of the word pine goes away. It gets, I think, overwhelmed by the U sound of ultima. And so somehow it becomes the word penult. So again, penult is a cut down version of pine ultima, almost last. So the second to last syllable is called the penult. Finally, the third syllable from the end is the antipenult. In Latin, the word ante, A-N-T-E, means before. So if you take the word penult and then you put ante before it, 
you get antipenalt literally before almost last. So that's the etymology of these words. The last syllable is ultima because it's last. The second to last syllable is the penalt because it's almost last, pine ultima. And then the third from the end is the antipenalt because it's ante pine ultima before the almost last. Okay, so as we go along, we're going to use those terms to refer to the different syllables at the end of a Latin word. And so once you know those terms, now we can start to talk about what syllable receives the accent in Latin. In Latin, we have what's called a stress accent. It means that one syllable gets a bit more emphasis than the others. Not all languages have a stress accent. For example, French does not have a stress accent. When you speak French, it's supposed to be sort of an endless stream of continuous syllables. In fact, I've had French people tell me that when they hear someone putting on a lot of emphasis on one syllable, that that sounds like uh, an unnatural French pronunciation. And in fact, a lot of people who speak French as a second language do it that way because that's, that's what they're accustomed to in their native language. So not every language has a stress accent, but Latin does. So we need to figure out what syllable receives the stress accent in a Latin word. And if you can do that, then you can pronounce the word correctly. So now it's time to talk about figuring out what syllable gets the accent in a Latin word, which is really the whole point of why I started this lecture in the first place, is to talk about accent. But as you can see, the idea of accent is connected to other issues. So I'm teaching it in tandem with other things. So let's talk about figuring out which syllable gets the accent. A few rules to think about. First of all, you can't have an accent on the last syllable of a Latin word. It's just not done. In some languages, you can have an accent on the final syllable of a word. For example, in Hebrew, you might have a word like anashim you know, with the accent thrown to the end, the last syllable. So that happens uh, in some languages, but not in Latin. We don't do that in Latin. So one rule that you can keep in mind is that you won't have an accent on the final syllable of a word. Another rule is that the accent cannot be more than three syllables from the end. In other words, you can't have an accent on the fourth syllable from the end or the fifth syllable from the end if it's a very long word. So really what that means is that in a Latin word, you can only have the accent on the second to last or third to last syllables, the syllables known as the penult or the antipenult. So those are the only two syllables that can get the accent. Of course, if a word only has two syllables, then the accent will be on the first syllable. But if you have a long word with, you know, three, four, five syllables, you really only have two choices of where the accent can go. It can go on the penult or the antipenult. So the choices are limited. So here's a big rule that you can use to help yourself figure out if the accent goes on the penult or on the antipenult. Okay, it's going to go on one of those two syllables. And here's how you can figure that out. Okay, here's the rule. Ready? If the penult is considered to be a long syllable, then that syllable will get the accent. If the penult is not considered to be a long syllable, then the accent moves one syllable to the left to the antipenult. Once again, in a shorter form, if the penult is a long syllable, it gets the accent. If the penult is not a long syllable, the accent goes to the antipenult. Not too difficult. So what we need to do to figure out which syllable gets the accent is we need to analyze the penult and figure out if it's long or not. So what things could make the penult a long syllable? What makes it long? One thing that can make it long is if it contains a long vowel. Remember that a vowel 
and a syllable are not the same thing. A vowel is a vowel. A syllable is a larger unit that can contain a vowel, or it can be comprised of a vowel, but it's not the same. So if a syllable contains a long vowel, then that syllable will be a long syllable. But what if it contains a short vowel? Does that make that syllable short? If you see a syllable and the syllable contains a short vowel, is it automatically short? The answer is no, not if it's a closed syllable. So when you're analyzing the penult to see if it's a long syllable or not, you also have to check and see if it's a closed syllable. Remember the rule, every closed syllable in Latin is a long syllable. And that's regardless of vowel length. If a closed syllable has a long vowel, or if a closed syllable has a short vowel, it doesn't matter. Either way, the syllable as a whole is considered to be a long syllable. So a closed syllable can contain a short vowel, but it could still be considered long as a syllable. This is the key reason why syllabification is the best way to teach these issues. Because if you don't understand syllabification, you know, if you don't know how to divide up a word into syllables, it's hard to tell if it's open or closed. Oftentimes they'll explain it to you with unclear language, like two consonants make position, a kind of a vague statement that doesn't really say much of anything. The correct way to do it is to figure out the syllabification and see if the syllables are open or closed. Again, anytime you see a closed syllable, that's going to be considered a long syllable in Latin, even if the vowel that it contains is a short vowel. So we want to figure out which syllable gets the accent in a Latin word. So we examine the penult, that is the next to last syllable. We ask ourselves a couple of questions. Does it contain a long vowel? If the answer is yes, then that syllable is long and it will get the accent. If the syllable is a closed syllable, it's going to be considered long as a syllable and it will get the accent. So if it's not long, if the vowel is a short vowel and it's not a closed syllable, you know, if it's an open syllable, then that syllable is not long in any way. And so the accent will go back to the antepenult, that is the third from the end. Okay, quick review. To figure out what syllable the accent goes on, you look at the penult. You see if it's got a long vowel or you see if it's a closed syllable. If it meets either of those criteria, the syllable is long and it gets the accent. If not, then that syllable is a short syllable and the accent goes one notch to the left to the antepenult. And that's it. That's how you figure out accent in Latin. So I'm hoping that by this point you can see how syllabification is connected to these other issues. Syllabification is connected to syllable length. Syllable length is directly connected to figuring out what syllable gets the accent. You see, all these things are connected together, and so it's difficult to teach them separately. It's better to teach them in tandem, all built on the foundation of syllabification, the ability to divide up a Latin word correctly into its syllables. So when this is taught in Latin classes, sometimes it's done in a way that's not very clear and not very helpful. So I'm trying to remedy that with this lecture. What I'm arguing for here is that a syllabification-based method is the most helpful and most clear for students, the most easy for them to understand. That's what I'm arguing for here. Okay, so we're almost ready to start working through some actual Latin words to figure out the accent. But before we do that, let's have a quick review of what you have learned so far in this lesson. I'll just give you a quick review, point by point, of what I've been trying to communicate here. First of all, syllabification is the best way to teach scansion, syllable length, accent. Syllabification is the foundation that you can build all that on. 
Moving on. The majority of the time in Latin, a consonant will start a syllable. Not always. Sometimes you'll have a syllable that's just a vowel only. You know, the, the entire syllable consists just of a vowel. Sometimes at the ends of verbs, you'll see that. And also in other words. But the majority of the time, a consonant will begin a syllable. So when you're dividing up a word into syllables, you try to find the next consonant, and that's going to start the next syllable the majority of the time. If you have two consonants in a row, the first consonant is going to end the previous syllable, or we might say it's going to close the previous syllable. The second consonant will begin the next syllable. Okay, so when you see two consonants in a row, the first consonant is at the end of a closed syllable because closed syllables end with consonants. Now, an exception to this is letter combinations like TR, PR, BR, KR, which I'll speak more about in a moment. Moving on, an open syllable is a syllable that ends with a vowel sound. A closed syllable is a syllable that ends with a consonant. And finally, a closed syllable, no matter what, is going to be considered a long syllable. A closed syllable is a long syllable, even if it contains a short vowel. A syllable and a vowel are two different things. A syllable can be long because it's closed, despite the fact that it contains a short vowel. Okay, so in your mind, you got to think of those two things separately. When a syllable is closed and it's considered to be long, it doesn't change the vowel length. The vowel is still the same. What it changes is the way you view that syllable. So if somebody says to you, when there are two consonants, it lengthens the vowel before that. That's just wrong. It doesn't lengthen the vowel. It makes a closed syllable, which is considered to be a long syllable, even though it has a short vowel in it. That's one of the incorrect things you'll hear sometimes. An open syllable could be long or could be short. It depends on the length of the vowel. If an open syllable has a short vowel, it's short. The syllable is short. If an open syllable has a long vowel, then that syllable is long. So if it's an open syllable, you have to look at the vowel length to see if it's long or short. But if it's closed, if it's a closed syllable, it's automatically considered a long syllable. Okay, one more thing before we go on to examining some actual Latin words. I'd like to say a quick word. Well, I hardly ever say anything too quickly. I tend to be a bit long-winded. But I want to say a word about a certain kind of sound called a stop. In linguistics, we have a certain kind of sound that the human mouth can make called a stop. In older textbooks, they call them mutes, M-U-T-E. But generally today, they're called stops. And what a stop is, is a kind of sound you make in which you stop the air from flowing through your mouth. The air builds up, and then the air is released. So that's why they call it a stop, is because the air stops. The air stops flowing. You use some part of your mouth to stop the air, the air builds up, and then it releases. And we have a total of six letters in our alphabet that do that. Okay, and they are P, T, K, B, D, and G. Those letters are called stops. Let's think about it a minute. When you say the letter P, you put your lips together, the air builds up for a second, and then you release it with your lips. P, like that. So that's a lip based stop, a stop that has the air being stopped because of the lips. Another one is the letter T. With the letter T, you get your tongue and you press your tongue against the roof of your mouth, sort of near the front of the roof of your mouth, near your top teeth. Your tongue stops the flow of air, the air builds up for a second, and then your tongue releases it, T, like that. That same kind of tongue action is used when you play a musical instrument. If you play the, you know, the clarinet or the saxophone or the trumpet, 
you can use that opening and closing of the tongue to control the air flowing into the instrument. Okay, so the letter T is another kind of stop. Another stop is the letter K. When you say the letter K, you close off the back of the mouth. The air builds up for a second, K, and then you release it and you get a K sound, okay? So you can do a stop with your lips, with your tongue, or with the back of the mouth, three different places in your mouth that you can stop the flow of air. For each of the three sounds I just described, there is a partner sound, a corresponding sound. Notice that for P, T, and K, you don't vibrate your vocal cords. When I say P, T, K, when I say P, T, or K, my vocal cords are not vibrating. But if I do vibrate my vocal cords, they turn into different letters. If I say a P, but I vibrate my vocal cords, it turns into a B. B, P, B. Okay, so the letter B is really just a P, but with your vocal cords vibrating while you release the air. Same thing for the letter T. The letter T has a partner. That's the letter D. So the letter D is just like a T, except your vocal cords are vibrating. So if I say T, a T sound, my vocal cords are not vibrating. But if I vibrate my vocal cords while saying the T, I get D, a D sound. Same thing with the letter K. The letter K has a partner, and that's the letter G. If I stop the air with the back of my mouth and release it without vibrating my vocal cords, I get a K sound. But if my vocal cords are vibrating while I do that, I get G, a G sound. So in your notes, you could write P, T, and K. And then under the P, you could write the letter B. Under the T, you could write a D. Underneath the K, you could write the letter G. And so the top row there, P, T, and K, we call those stops voiceless stops. They're voiceless because your vocal cords are not vibrating when you say them. Across the bottom of your little uh, diagram, B, D, and G, we call those voiced stops because your vocal cords are vibrating as you say them. Okay, so we have voiceless stops, P, T, and K, and voiced stops, B, D, and G. P and B are partners. They're both produced the same way with the lips, but P is voiceless while B is voiced. So they're partners like that. Same with T and D. T and D are both made uh, with the tongue pressing against the front part of the roof of the mouth, right behind the teeth. The only difference is that T is voiceless while D is voiced. So they're partners. They correspond to each other. Same with K and G. They're both produced by stopping the air in the back of the mouth and then releasing it. The only difference is that K is voiceless while G is voiced. So K is the voiceless partner and G is the voiced partner. So K and G are like partners. They correspond to each other. Okay, so that was a quick introduction to stops. Why am I telling you this? Why am I telling you about stops? in a lecture about accent. The answer is that in certain combinations, these stops join together with the next consonant. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, we have a couple of sounds in the alphabet that are called liquids because they're smooth sounds. That's the letter L and the letter R. When you say an L or an R, the air does not stop in any way. L, er. See, those are just continuous sounds. So we have stops and we have liquids. The stops are P, T, K, B, D, and G. The liquids are L and R. So here's what happens. When you have a stop and a liquid together, something special happens, okay? So that could be a combination of, say, a P and an L, like pl, or it could be a combination of T and R, it could be BR, DR, GR, GL, DL, TL, KL. Any of those combinations, a stop plus a liquid, they have a special characteristic. 
Okay, when you see those two consonants in a row, it will generally not split the syllable. Up to this point, I've been saying when you see two consonants in a row, that's where you split the syllable. This is an exception to that rule. If you see a stop plus a liquid, like PR, TR, KR, BL, DL, GL, those will just sound together. Pla, you know, cra, tra, gra. And so that stop plus liquid together, they will start the next syllable together. So that's called the stop plus liquid rule. And I'll refer back to that as we go through some actual Latin examples. Okay, it's time now to start examining some actual Latin words. And we're going to analyze them. First, we're going to divide them into syllables. Then we're going to notice whether those syllables are open or closed. And then we're going to identify the last, second to last, and third to last syllables, known as the ultima, the penult, and the antipenult. And lastly, we'll examine the next to last syllable, known as the penult, to see if it's long or short. And that will help us know where the accent goes in that particular word. And as we go along, and we do lots of examples, hopefully you'll start to get accustomed to the, the different terminology, and you'll start to learn how to identify these things on your own. And conveniently, here in chapter 33, we have a nice long list of Latin words in the vocabulary review section. That's section 270. So we can use those as words to analyze. So let's jump in and start with angustiae, which is the first word in the left column. The word angustiae has four syllables. Let's find out what they are. We start out with the vowel A, and then we have two consonants in a row. We have N and G. And so that will be the border between the first two syllables. So we can draw a line between the N and the G. The first syllable is on. The N ends the first syllable, and then the G begins the second syllable. Now we have G, U, S, and T. With S and T, we have two consonants in a row again. Again, we're going to divide the syllables between those two consonants. So you can draw another line between the S and the T. And so the second syllable is G-U-S, gus. The S will end the second syllable, and the T will begin the third syllable. The third syllable is the T and the I. And then for the final syllable, there's no consonant to start it out. That particular syllable consists only of a vowel sound. In this case, a diphthong comprised of the vowels A and E. And that sounds like I. So draw another line between the I and the A, and our syllables are on, gus, T, I. Our first syllable, A, N, ends with a consonant, so that's a closed syllable. The second syllable, G, U, S, ends with a consonant as well, so that's also a closed syllable. T, I, the third syllable, ends with a vowel, so that's an open syllable. The final one, AE, that also ends with a vowel, so that's an open syllable. Let's identify the last three syllables of this word, AE. That particular syllable is called the ultima. TI is the second from the end, so that syllable is called the penult. GUS is the third syllable from the end, so we call that the antipenult. Okay, we've divided up the syllables. We've identified if they're open or closed, and we've identified the names of them. Now let's take a look at the penult, and we can figure out where to put the accent in this word. The way we do it is we analyze the syllable known as the penult. That's the next to last syllable, and we figure out if it's a long syllable or a short syllable. So let's take a look. That particular syllable is T-I. Does that syllable contain a long vowel? No, it contains a short I. There's no maker on there. Is the syllable a closed syllable? No, T-I is an open syllable. So the penult here, the second syllable from the end, is not long. Therefore, the accent will go one syllable over to the left, 
to the antepenult, which in this case is G-U-S. So we'll put the stress accent on that particular syllable, and the word will sound like angustiae. Let's move on now to audakia. Let's divide it into syllables. First, we have another diphthong. That's A and U together, and it says ow, like when you drop something on your toe. Then the consonant D will begin the next syllable. So the next syllable is D-A. Then the consonant C will start the next syllable. So the syllable after that is C-I. And then at the end, we have a syllable that consists only of a vowel. There's no consonant there to start off that syllable. Okay, so the first syllable, ow, is an open syllable. Da is open. Ki is open. And the final syllable, which consists only of a vowel, is open because it ends with a vowel. So we have all open syllables here, ow, da, ki, ya. Counting backwards from the end of the word, we have the letter A making up the ultima, ci, ki makes up the penult, and da makes the antipenult. Let's figure out where the accent goes. Let's look at the penult and see if it's a long syllable or a short syllable. So in the syllable ci, do we have a long vowel? No, it's just an I. It's a short I. There's no macron. Is it a closed syllable? No, C-I ends with a vowel, so that's an open syllable. Okay, so there's nothing making the penult a long syllable. It's not long, so the accent will go back one notch to the left and end up on the D-A syllable, known as the anti-penult. And the word will sound like audakia. Next is animus. We start out with the letter A. That forms a whole syllable by itself, an open syllable. The next one is N-I. That's an open syllable. Uh, The M is a consonant, which will start the next syllable. And that's all we've got. Uh, The last syllable is M-U-S. So the last syllable, M-U-S, is a closed syllable because it ends with a consonant. N-I is an open syllable because it ends with a vowel. And The first syllable, which consists only of an A, is an open syllable. So we have open, open, closed. The M-U-S syllable is the ultima, the N-I syllable is the penult, and the A syllable is the antipenult. Where does the accent go? Let's examine the penult syllable and see if it's a long syllable or a short syllable. That syllable, the penult, is N-I. Does that particular syllable contain a long vowel? No. It has a short I. There's no macron. Is it a closed syllable? No. N-I is an open syllable because it ends with a vowel. Okay, so there's nothing making the penult into a long syllable. So the accent will move over one notch to the left to the antipenult. And so this word will sound like animus. Costellum is next. We have three syllables here. The first one is C-A. And then we have two consonants in a row. So to divide up the syllables, we'll draw a line between the S and the T. So the letter S will end the first syllable, and the letter T will start the next syllable. So our first syllable is C-A-S, which is a closed syllable because it ends with a consonant. Now we have T-E, and then we have two more consonants in a row, a double L. So when we have two consonants like that, again, we'll draw the line between syllables between those two consonants. And so the first L will end the second syllable. The second L will begin the next syllable. So the middle syllable here is T-E-L, another closed syllable. Finally, we have L-U-M. That's the last syllable of the word. Yet again, it's a closed syllable. So this word contains all closed syllables. Kas, tell, lum. Lum is the last syllable, and so we call that the ultima. T-E-L is the next to last syllable, so we call that the penult. And C-A-S, cas, is third from the end, so we call that the antipenult. What syllable gets the accent? Well, let's take a look at the penult and see if it's a long syllable or a short syllable. The penult is T-E-L. Let's ask ourselves a couple of questions. First of all, does that syllable contain a long vowel? No, the E is short. There's no macron over it. 
Is it a closed syllable? Aha, yes, that particular syllable is closed. It's T-E-L, and so it ends with the consonant L. Remember the rule. In Latin, any closed syllable is considered a long syllable. It doesn't matter that this syllable contains a short vowel. The vowel is not lengthened. There's no turning that short E into a long E. The E there is short and it stays short. But as a syllable, the penult here, T-E-L, is considered to be a long syllable. So since the penult here is a long syllable, it will get the accent. The accent won't go over to the anti-penult. It'll stay here on the penult. And so this word sounds like costellum. Conatum is next. Here the first syllable is an open syllable. That's C and O. Then we have N and A as the second syllable, another open syllable. And finally, T-U-M. Notice how each consonant starts the next syllable. T-U-M is a closed syllable. That's called the ultima because it's last. Na, N-A, is the penult because it's next to last. And then C-O is the anti-penult because it's third from the end. So we have open, open, closed. Which syllable gets the accent? Let's take a look at the penult. The penult here is N-A. So let's ask ourselves a couple of questions. First of all, does that syllable contain a long vowel? In this case, yes. Notice the macron over the letter A. Since the penult contains a long vowel, then we will consider that syllable to be a long syllable. And so it will get the accent. The penult is long a long syllable, so it gets the accent. And so this word sounds like conatum. Imperium is next. We have four syllables here. We have the vowel I at the beginning, and then immediately after that, we have two consonants. So we'll draw a line between the M and the P. The letter M will end the first syllable. The letter P will begin the next syllable. So the second syllable consists of P and E. The consonant R starts the next syllable, which is R and I. And for our final syllable, there is no consonant to start it out. It's just U-M, which is a closed syllable. So we have closed, open, open, closed. The U-M syllable is the ultima. The R-I syllable is the penult. The P-E syllable is the anti-penult. What syllable gets the accent? Well, let's take a look at the penult and find out. Is the penult a long syllable or a short syllable? The penult is the R-I syllable. Does that syllable contain a long vowel? No, the I does not have a macron. It's a short I. Is that syllable a closed syllable? No, it's an open syllable because I is a vowel. Okay, so the penult is not a long syllable. Therefore, the accent will jump over to the left one notch to the antipenult. That's the P-E syllable. So this word will sound like imperium. Let's skip ahead a bit down to talum. Talum is only two syllables. So the accent will come on the first syllable. Whenever you have a two-syllable word, it just automatically comes on the first syllable because in Latin we don't put the accent on the last syllable. Okay, so the ultima here is L-U-M. That's a closed syllable. And the penult is T and E. That's an open syllable. In kalamitas, we have a consonant starting every syllable. C-A is the first syllable. The consonant L starts the next syllable. The consonant M starts the next syllable. And the consonant T starts the next syllable. So ka la me tas are the syllables. They're all open except for tas, which ends with the consonant S. Tas is the ultima. M-I is the penult, and L-A is the anti-penult. Which syllable will receive the stress accent? Well, let's take a look at the penult. That's the M-I syllable. Does that particular syllable contain a long vowel? No, the I does not have a macron. Is it a closed syllable? No, it's just M-I, which is an open syllable. Okay, so there's nothing making the penult long in any way. There's nothing making it into a long syllable. So the accent goes over to the anti-penult, which is the L-A syllable. So this word sounds like 
Kalamitas. Let's go down to Facultas. Now, I'm tempted to pronounce this one as Facultas because it reminds me of the English word faculty. But let's take a look at it. The first syllable is F-A. Then the consonant C starts the next syllable. Then we have an L and a T. We have two consonants in a row. So we will divide the syllables between the L and the T. The L will end the second syllable, and the T will begin the next syllable. So the second syllable here is C-U-L, a closed syllable. The third and final syllable is T-A-S. That's another closed syllable. Okay, so T-A-S is the ultima, C-U-L is the penult, and F-A is the antipenult. Which syllable will receive the accent? Let's take a look at the penult. That's C-U-L. Does that syllable contain a long vowel? No, the U is short because it does not have a macron. Is that particular syllable a closed syllable? Hmm, yes it is because it's C-U-L. It ends with a consonant. So C-U-L is a closed syllable. In Latin, any closed syllable is considered a long syllable. It doesn't matter that the vowel inside that syllable is short. The letter U here is a short vowel. It stays short. Nothing lengthens the vowel, but the syllable is considered to be a long syllable. So here the penult is a long syllable, and so it will get the accent. Despite the fact that I want to put the accent on the F-A syllable, really, according to the rules, it goes on the C-U-L syllable. So it's facultas. Humanitas is next. The first syllable is H-U. The letter M, a consonant, starts the next syllable, which is M-A. The N starts the next syllable, which is N-I. Finally, we have a closed syllable at the end. That's T-A-S. So hu ma ne tas open, 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 closed. Tas is the ultima. N-I is the penult, and M-A is the antipenult. What syllable will receive the stress accent? Let's look at the penult and find out. The penult here is N-I. Does that syllable contain a long vowel? No. Is it a closed syllable? No, it's an open syllable. So there's nothing making the penult into a long syllable. Therefore, the accent will go over to the antipenult. So instead of humanitas, it's humanitas. Okay, the accent goes to the antipenult. Next is munitio. The first syllable is mu. The consonant n starts the next syllable. That's ni. The consonant t starts the next syllable. That's ti. And then the final syllable consists only of a vowel. There's no consonant there to start off that syllable. So the o at the end is the ultima. Ti is the penult, and ni is the antipenult. What syllable gets the accent? Let's look at the penult, which is T-I. Does it contain a long vowel? No, the I is short. Is it a closed syllable? No, T-I is an open syllable. So there's nothing making that penult into a long syllable. So the accent goes to the antipenult, which is N-I. So this word sounds like munitio. Let's move down a bit to Timor. Timor is a two-syllable word, so there's not much to talk about. In a two-syllable word, the accent goes on the first syllable because we don't put the accent on the final syllable of a Latin word. So, Timor. Lastly, on this line, we have turpitudo. Notice that we have an R and a P next to each other, two consonants in a row. So, that's where we'll divide the first syllable from the second syllable between the consonants. So, the first syllable is T-U-R. Then we have P-I. That's the second syllable. The letter T is a consonant that will start the next syllable. Then the consonant D will start the next syllable. So tur, pe, tu, do. Do is the ultima, tu is the penult, and pi is the antipenult. Which syllable will receive the stress accent? Well, let's take a look at the penult. That's tu. Does that particular syllable contain a long vowel? In this case, yes. Notice the macron over the letter U. Since the penult contains a long vowel, it makes the whole syllable long. And so the penult is long. 
Therefore, it will keep the accent. So this particular word sounds like torpedo. Okay, we're getting some good practice here. Let's look at a couple more words that are down in the review sentence area. That's section 271. Let's take a look at the word conyurandi in exercise two. It's the last word of exercise two. We have four syllables, conyurandi. Let's do syllabification and divide them up. Keep in mind that in Latin, we have two flavors of the letter I. We have a consonantal I, and we have a vocalic I. That means the letter I functioning as a vowel. So when you see the letter I, it could be either a vowel or a consonant. And that's important because if something is a vowel or a consonant, it helps determine whether it's going to close a syllable or whether it makes two consonants in a row. So that's important stuff to think about. Notice here the third letter is the letter N, and the fourth letter is the letter I. That syllable sounds like your. So what we have here in the fourth letter is a consonantal I. That particular I is functioning as a consonant. So the N and the I here are two consonants in a row. So to divide up the syllables here, we need to draw a line between the N and the I. By the way, any time in Latin there's a consonantal I, in English derivatives, that ends up being the letter J. You know, in the Middle Ages, they put a tail on consonantal I to differentiate it from vocalic I. So the English derivative conjure, C-O-N-J-U-R-E, has a J there where the consonantal I is in Latin. In fact, in some textbooks, they actually put a consonantal I as a J. They represent consonantal I with the letter J. You'll see that in some Latin textbooks. But anyway, back to the word conurandi. The first syllable here will be C-O-N, and then the consonantal I, which is a consonant, will start the next syllable. The next syllable is I and U, and then the consonant R will start the next syllable. Notice that we have an N and a D next to each other. That's two consonants in a row. So that's where we will draw the line between syllables. The N will end the previous syllable, and the D will start the next syllable. So R-A-N is the third syllable. Finally, we have D-I as the last syllable in this word. D-I is the ultima. R-A-N is the penult. I-U-R is the antipenult. C-O-N is a closed syllable. I-U is an open syllable. R-A-N is closed because it ends with an N, and D-I is open. Which syllable will receive the stress accent? Let's look at the penult. That's R-A-N. Does that particular syllable contain a long vowel? No, the A is short. Is it a closed syllable? Yes, R-A-N is a closed syllable because it ends with the letter N, which is a consonant. It doesn't matter that the vowel contained in this syllable is a short vowel. Still, as a whole, that particular syllable is considered long because it's a closed syllable. Remember that in Latin, anytime you have a closed syllable, it's considered a long syllable. Vowel length is not necessarily the same as syllable length. Okay, so the penult is a long syllable, and so it will keep the accent for itself. It will not go back to the antipenult. So this word will sound like conurandi. Now keep in mind that this same N and D will be here whenever you see a gerund or a gerundive. In all the gerunds and gerundives, the letter N is going to close off the second to last syllable, that is the penult. And by making that syllable closed, that means that penult will be a long syllable, and so it will get the accent. So whenever you see a gerund or a gerundive, and you have an N there at the end of the penult, and a D starting off the ultima, it's going to put the accent on the penult. If it's not on the penult, you know, if the N and the D get moved over to the antipenult, then that doesn't work. But for gerunds, they're always singular. So gerunds will always have the accent on the penult. Let's think of uh, the gerund forms of laudo. We'll have laudandi, laudando, laudandum, laudando. Okay, so for every form of the gerund for laudando, 
having that N and D there, it makes the penult a closed syllable. That makes it a long syllable, and so the penult gets the accent there. So that's just something to watch out for for gerunds and gerundives. It won't always work like that for gerundives because they could have longer endings. But just keep your eye on it, and you'll see what I mean. Let me show you a couple of examples of the stop plus liquid thing that I was mentioning earlier. Look in the fourth column in section 270. In the fourth column, the third word is intercludo. The C and the L there form a stop plus liquid. I know I told you that it was the letter K, but in Latin, the letter C is always a hard C. So it sounds the same as a K. So the C and the L there, cl, would sound together. That's stop plus liquid. So really you have three consonants in a row there. You have the R, the C, and the L. But you would not draw the line between syllables between the C and the L. That's a stop plus liquid. So they sound together as one unit. You would draw the line between syllables between the R and the C. Also in section 272 in Caesar's Gallic Wars, Look at the very last word on the last line, septentriones. There you see a T and an R together. So that T and R, that's another example of the stop plus liquid. The letter T is a stop, the letter R is a liquid. And so that tr sound, the T and the R will sound together. Despite the fact that they are two consonants, you would not draw a line between them. They would not, you would not split the syllables between those two because they're kind of one unit. The place where you would draw the line between syllables is between the N and the T. Okay, so the T, along with the R, starts the next syllable. The N ends the previous syllable. One other thing I want to mention is double consonants. Let's take a look at the very bottom row of page 100. Look at the word traduxerant at the very bottom of page 100 in section 271. Notice that traduxerant has the letter X. Okay, the letter X is what we call a double consonant. Why is it a double consonant? Because it contains what would amount to a K followed by an S. The letter X has a X sound. So it's as if you put a K and an S together. So when you're trying to divide up the word traduxerant into syllables, you have to do it in such a way where you imagine the letter X really to be a K and an S because it has both of those sounds in there. So the first syllable would be T-R-A, then the letter D would start the next syllable, and then you have two consonants in a row, the K and the S, that are represented by the X. So the K will end the D-U syllable and then the S will start the next syllable. So really that second syllable will be D-U-K, and then the following syllable will be starting with the S and go S-E. Then the final syllable will be R-A-N-T, rant. So what you get is tra duk se rant So the first syllable, T-R-A, is an open syllable. The second syllable is D-U-K, That's a closed syllable. Then S-E is an open syllable. R-A-N-T is a closed syllable. There's nothing to make the penult into a long syllable. The penult does not contain a long vowel, and the penult is not a closed syllable. So the accent moves over to the antipenult, and it sounds like traduxerant. Okay, now let's do a little bit of homework. Why don't you do the second column in section 270 on your own. See if you can divide up the syllables. See if you can figure out which syllable receives the stress accent. So turn the recording off and analyze the second column starting with non nulli in section 270. And when you're finished, turn the recording back on and we'll go over them together. Okay, hopefully you've done some homework here. Let's go over these words together in the second column in section 270. First we have non nulli. We have two N's there, so we'll split the syllables between those two N's. The first syllable will be N-O-N, 
which is a closed syllable. And then we have two more consonants next to each other, the double L. So the first L will end the previous syllable. The next L will begin the next syllable. So the middle syllable here is N-U-L. Finally, we have L and I as the last syllable. So L-I is the ultima, N-U-L is the penult, N-O-N is the anti-penult. Where's the accent? Well, let's look at the penult. Does the penult contain a long vowel? Yes, it contains a long U. And not only that, it's a closed syllable. So it's definitely a long syllable, and so it will get the accent. So this word sounds like nonuli. Paratus is next. We have an open syllable, P-A. Another open syllable, R-A. And then T-U-S, a closed syllable at the end. Okay, so T-U-S is the ultima, R-A is the penult, P-A is the antipenult. Where's the accent? Let's examine the penult. We have an R and an A there. Does the penult contain a long vowel? Yes, it contains a long A. So the fact that that syllable contains a long vowel will make the whole syllable a long syllable. So the accent will stay on the penult, and it sounds like paratus. Next we have qualis. That's a two-syllable word. So the accent automatically falls on the first syllable. The first syllable is Q-U-A. The second one starts with the consonant L, L-I-S. Heek is next. It's just one syllable in that word. Ile is a two-syllable word, so the accent automatically goes to the first syllable. Remember that in Latin, the final syllable of a word will not receive a stress accent. So in a two-syllable word, it automatically ends up being on the first syllable. Same thing for ipse. It's a two-syllable word. Yam is one syllable. Notice that yam starts with a consonantal I. Ibi is two syllables, so the accent falls on the first syllable. Next is propteria. This particular word has four syllables. Notice at the beginning of it, there's a stop plus liquid. Now, the letter P is a stop a voiceless stop to be more specific, and the letter R is a liquid. So P and R together makes a stop plus liquid. So those two letters will sound together as one unit, pra. We have a P and a T here next to each other. So we'll draw the syllable dividing line between them. The letter P will end the first syllable while the letter T starts the next one. So our first syllable is prop, and that's a closed syllable. Next is T-E, that's an open syllable, and then R-E is the next syllable. And then the final syllable consists only of a vowel, it's just the letter A. So we have prop, te, re, a. A is the ultima, re is the penult, te is the anti-penult. Where does the accent go? Well, let's look at the penult, that's R and E. Does that syllable contain a long vowel? No. The E is short. Is it a closed syllable? No, it's an open syllable because R and E, that's all it is. It ends with the letter E, which is a vowel. So there's nothing to make the penult into a long syllable here. So the accent will go to the left one notch to the anti-penult. And so this word will sound like propteria. Seek is next, just one syllable. Let's skip over out and out. Those are just one syllable each. Also, well, well, those are correlatives. Next is comporto. Three syllables here. We have an M and a P together, two consonants next to each other. So the M will end the previous syllable. The P will start the next syllable. So com is the first syllable, which is a closed syllable because it ends with a consonant. Now we have two more consonants together, an R and a T. So again, we'll divide the syllables between them. The letter R will end the previous syllable. The T will start the next one. So we have com, and then we have pour, two closed syllables, and then an open syllable at the end. Okay, T-O is the ultima. That's an open syllable. P-O-R is the penult. C-O-M is the anti-penult. Where's the accent? Well, let's check the penult and see if it's a long syllable or not. The syllable is P-O-R. 
Does that syllable contain a long vowel? No, the letter O is short. There's no macron. Is it a closed syllable? Yes, it's closed because it ends with a letter R, which is a consonant. In Latin, any closed syllable is considered to be a long syllable. It doesn't matter that the O is short. The vowel is short, but the syllable as a whole is a long syllable. Therefore, the penult is a long syllable, and so it will keep the accent for itself. It will not jump over to the antipenult. And so this word sounds like comporto. Conchilio is next. We have two consonants next to each other, the N and the C. So we'll divide the syllables between them. So the first syllable is a closed syllable, con. The letter C starts the second syllable, which is C-I. Then the consonant L starts the next syllable, which is L-I. And finally, we have just the letter O comprising the last syllable by itself. There's no consonant there to start off that syllable. So the letter O is the ultima, L-I is the penult, and C-I is the antipenult. Where's the accent? Let's take a look at the penult and see if it's a long or short syllable. L-I is the penult. Does that syllable contain a long vowel? No, the I is short. Is it a closed syllable? No, the L and I together form an open syllable. An open syllable ends with a vowel. So the accent hops over one notch to the left to the antipenult, which is C-I. So this word sounds like conchilio. Conjuro is next. Again, we have a consonantal I here. The fourth letter of this word is the letter I, but it's consonantal. So we have N and I together. That's two consonants. So we'll divide the syllables between them. So the first syllable is C-O-N, which is a closed syllable. And then the consonantal I will start the next syllable, which is I and U. Then R-O is the last syllable. The consonant R starts that one off. Okay, so R-O is the ultima, I-U is the penult, and C-O-N is the antipenult. Where's the accent? Let's take a look at the penult and see if it's a long or short syllable. The penult here is consonantal I and U. Does that particular syllable contain a long vowel? Yes, it contains a long U. So the fact that it contains a long vowel makes that entire syllable a long syllable. So the penult is a long syllable, and it will keep the accent for itself. And the word sounds like conjuro. Next we have delibero. Four syllables. The first one is D-E. The consonant L starts the next one, L-I. The consonant B starts the next one, B-E. The consonant R starts the next one. So here we have four open syllables, each being begun by a consonant. de li be ro four open syllables in a row. So rho is the ultima, B-E is the penult, L-I is the antipenult. Where's the accent? Let's take a look at the penult and see if it's a long or short syllable. The syllable consists of a B and an E, be. Does it contain a long vowel? No, the E is short. Is it a closed syllable? No, together B and E make an open syllable. So there's nothing making the penult into a long syllable here. So the penult is not long, and so the accent moves over to the antipenult, which is L-I. So this word will sound like de libero. Okay, let's wrap up this part of the lecture. I hope that you've enjoyed this and that it's given you a good introduction to issues like syllabification, scansion, figuring out where the accent is. A couple of quick notes as we finish up here. In Latin, we have some endings like... Uh, the ending Q-U-E, which means and. If you have the Q-U-E ending tagged onto the end of a word, that counts as the last syllable, and so it changes the syllable count as you count from the end. According to Allen and Greenow, if you have Q-U-E at the end of a word, it automatically puts the accent on the syllable right before that. So, for example, if you have the Latin word feminae, that's nominative plural, and it means women, and you add the que ending, Q-U-E, it becomes feminaique, which now means and women. And so the accent is now on the syllable right before the que, so it's feminaique, like that. So that's one 
extra rule to be aware of. Another rule to be aware of is that if you're reading Latin poetry, if there is a vowel at the end of a word and the next word begins with a vowel, you can have vowels dropping out. That's called elision. So that's a special thing to study if you start looking at poetry is elision. Also, in Latin, the letter M at the end of a word is very weak. Linguists believe that the ancient Romans didn't pronounce the, the final M very strongly. In fact, from what I've been told, the letter M had sort of a nasalized sound. For example, look at section 271. In exercise 5, we have facultas per provinciam. Okay? The word provinciam is a first declension accusative singular. Notice that it ends with the letter M. When I pronounce it, I pronounce the M very clearly for clear pronunciation. So if I'm teaching, someone can hear the morphology, you know, the form of the word. Or if I'm speaking Latin with my friends, they'll hear, you know, what case I'm putting that word in. But from what I've been told, the ancient Romans pronounced it with kind of a nasalized sound, like provincial. So if you're reading Latin poetry and there's an M at the end of a word, and then the next word starts with a vowel, that M sound can just get swallowed up. Okay, so when you're reading poetry, keep in mind there are additional rules to be aware of. You know, like an M getting swallowed up at the end of a word, elisions, there's also something called hiatus. So there's more to learn when you do poetry. But the things I've told you here all still count. Everything I've told you here still works, but for poetry, there's extra stuff. Another thing off the top of my head, if one word ends with a consonant and the next word begins with a vowel, then the consonant at the end of the first word is going to start the next syllable that includes the next word. You just pronounce each syllable like a, a chain of words. That's the way it's done in French. That particular technique is known as enchaînement. It's just sort of an endless running series of syllables that spans across words. So when you read poetry, there are a few more things to learn about. But what you have here from this lecture is a good start. So from now on, as we go forward, you will always know what syllable receives the stress accent in a Latin word. You know how to check the penult of a Latin word to see if it's a long syllable or not. You've had some good practice, so you know how to analyze the penult, figure out if it's long or short, and then you know how to place the accent. That's hopefully what you can take away from this lesson, along with some other foundational knowledge. So that's it for the first part of this lecture. Now we will move on to section 272, which is our new passage of Caesar's Gallic Wars that we have not read yet. Okay, so let's jump in now to section 272, and we'll learn about the boundaries of ancient Gaul, as described by Julius Caesar. Really, it's the last part of chapter one of book one of Caesar's Gallic Wars. And I was doing a little bit of reading in Hans Friedrich Mueller's book, his commentary on Caesar, which is quite good, by the way, I recommend it to you. And he was saying that this particular part that we're reading today is somewhat vague. It's a geographical description of the different parts of Gaul. It talks about rivers. And he said that some commentators don't even think it's original, that it was added by someone else later who thought that this section needed additional geographical description. So the Latin here is a little strange, a little weird. But that's what we have here, so let's give it a shot. Let's take the first sentence up to the word Rodano, and there we will find a semicolon. So we'll take that as kind of a first sentence unit. It says here, Eorum una pars quam gallos obtenere dictum est, initium capit a flumine Rodano. The main subject and verb here are pars, and cop it. Parse means part. Cop it means take. So a part takes. That's the main subject and verb here. So we have a main clause 
in which pars and copit are the subject and verb, and then we have a relative clause embedded in the middle of that, the part that says quam gallos obtenere dictum est. That's a relative clause. Everything else is the main clause. So let's take a look at the main clause first. Pars has the word una along with it. Una means one. It's feminine because pars is feminine. That's a third declension feminine noun. So one part, cop it. One part takes. Cop it is one of the third conjugation I-O verbs that we've been looking at recently. You might remember that in Lesson 30, we learned all about third conjugation I-O verbs. Okay, so una, pars, and kapit says one part takes. The direct object here is initium. That means beginning. That's a second declension neuter noun. So one part takes a beginning. Then we have a prepositional phrase, a flumine rodano. A means from. Flumina is the ablative singular form of flumen, which means river. And then rodano is the name of the river. That means the Rhone. So a flumine rodano means from the Rhone River. Una pars is being possessed by the genitive plural aorum. That's the demonstrative is a id here in the genitive plural. So we can translate aorum as of these. So aorum, una, and pars together will say of these, one part or perhaps one part of these. And what are the these being referred to? Apparently, he's talking about the three parts of Gaul that were mentioned earlier. So earlier he said, Gaul is divided into three parts. Now he's saying, of these, one part is like this, another part is like that. So Aorum is referring to what came before. So of the three parts of Gaul, one part of these, okay, that's the una pars aorum, one part of these, or of these, one part, initium caput, takes its beginning. And that's just a fancy way to say that it starts. Initium caput, we can simply translate as start. One part of these starts or begins from the Rhone River. So since our reading today is talking about geography, it might benefit you to make use of the maps that I have posted on the Lenny's Latin Class website. If you have the Lenny's Latin Class textbook, the first year of Latin, there are a couple of maps in the back of the book, but they're not the best quality. They're kind of hard to read. But there's a really nice map on the Lenny's Latin Class website under the heading of study helps. So if you take a look at that, you'll be able to see the different rivers being referred to here. The part that Caesar's talking about right now is the main middle part of Gaul. In other words, the main middle part of what today would be France, not including Aquitaine and not including Belgium, which is a, you know, a separate country to the northeast of France. Okay, so that's the part that he's talking about. So he's saying, of these, one part starts from the Rhone River. So if you look at the map, you'll see where the Rhone River is. It starts somewhere between the Idui and the Sequani, and it flows south down into the Mediterranean. Keep in mind that the Romans occupied the bottom part of what would today be France, You know, they called that Provincia or the province. So in Caesar's mind, as you go west from the northern part of Italy, as you cross the Alps, it seems that in his mind, when you get to the Rhone River, that's when this sector of Gaul really starts. He seems to be suggesting that that's the border of where you really get into Gaul proper. Again, that's uh, the Rhone River. That's a north-south river that flows south down into the Mediterranean. I'm sure you'll be able to locate it on your map. If you can see the the city of Lugdunum, it flows through that. The main clause here says, of these, one part starts from the Rhone River. 
And in this part of Caesar's Gallic Wars, the preposition a or ab, which we are accustomed to translating as from, it can be translated different ways. We could translate it as at. If you look at the fourth line, you'll see ab, and then you'll see footnote four. It says there they're translating ab as on the side of. Then on the next line, they're translating ab as at. So there's a lot of flexibility here as far as what a or ab can mean. Again, as Hans Friedrich Mueller said, the geography here is a bit vague. So we can translate this as, you know, it takes a start, you know, from the Rhone River or it takes a start at the Rhone River. Probably the smoothest way to translate it would be just, it starts at the Rhone River. Of these, one part starts at the Rhone River. That's what we have so far. It starts there in the sense that if you're going from east to west, when you cross that, that's when you're in that territory. So whatever is to the west of that is what Caesar is referring to. Okay, now we have a relative clause, quam gallos obtenere dictum est. So that's our relative clause. It starts with the relative pronoun quam. The antecedent of quam is pars. Quam is singular because its antecedent pars is singular. Quam is feminine because its antecedent pars is feminine. But quam is accusative because of the role it plays in the relative clause. In the relative clause, we actually have some indirect speech. Dictum est is a compound tense. Okay, it's a tense made up of more than one word. We haven't even studied this form yet. It's a form of the verb dico, which means to say. So dictum and est, even though you haven't studied it yet, those two words together mean it has been said or it was said. You don't really need to translate that. Just just accept the fact that that's what those two words say. So dictum and est together make an impersonal statement that goes something like this. It was said or it has been said. And so with that statement of saying, or with that statement of something being said, it launches into indirect speech. Of course, you know that in indirect speech, we have an accusative plus infinitive construction. So in this indirect speech, we have galos as the subject. Galos is accusative plural. And then obtenere is the verb of the indirect statement. What it says here is, it has been said that the Gauls possess. Okay, Gallos and obtenere, that's the accusative plus infinitive structure of the indirect speech here. So why is quam accusative? Quam is accusative because it's the direct object of obtenere. It might help you to think of this as being in regular direct speech. Think of gali and obtenerunt, and then just forget about dictum est. Okay, if you have quam, gali, and obtenerunt, it would just say which the Gauls possess. But with dictum est, that throws us into indirect speech. It was said, then we need to throw in the word that, and then gallos obtenere, the Gauls possess. If we rearrange the word order, that might also help you see the structure. Literally, it would say the Gauls possess which. Okay, so in that sense, Quam is the direct object of obtenere. But they put quam first because that's natural for a relative clause. So this first whole sentence altogether says, of these, one part, which it was said that the Gauls possess, starts at the Rhone River. Okay, let's move on to the next sentence up to the semicolon after the word belgarum. Here's what it has. Contenator garum na flumene, oceano finibus belgarum. Here in this sentence, we have three ablatives of means. Okay, so we have passive activity here in the verb contenator, and that passive activity is being done by rivers and borders. So our main verb here is contenator. That's a form of the verb contineo, which means to hold something in or bound it to keep it in check. 
Here it's got the idea of it's bounded. It's got boundaries formed by something, okay? So we could just say it is bound. And what's the it? The it is the part of Gaul being talked about, that main middle part of Gaul. Caesar has already told us that it starts, uh, when you're traveling from east to west, it starts at the Rhone River. So in the southern part of France, it's everything from the Rhone over to the west. So you know that's the part being referred to. Again, it would be helpful if you refer to your map. Now he's going to tell us more about the borders of this section of Gaul. Okay, so Contenetur, it is bounded. And now we're going to see what it's bounded by. So we have three ablatives, which are ablatives of means. And they're going to tell us exactly what things are doing the bounding. That is, what geographical features are forming the boundaries of this part of Gaul. First, we have flumine. That's the ablative singular form of flumen. So it means by a river. And we have the name of the river here along with it, Garumna, which is also ablative singular. So Garumna and Flumine together say by the Garumna River. Contenetur Garumna Flumine says it is bounded by the Garumna River. Now today that river in French is called the Garonne River. On your map, look in the extreme southwestern part of France where it says Aquitania, and you'll see the Garonne River. And so that's the river being talked about here. What Caesar is saying is that that's kind of a western border. If you go beyond it, now you're into Aquitania, which is the next section of Gaul. So this main middle part of Gaul is what is to the north and east of the Garonne. So are you starting to get a picture of what this big middle part of Gaul looks like? On the east, we have the Rhone River as the boundary. On the west, we have the Garonne River. By the way, if you have a verb in Latin that is passive and you want to say by whom that activity is being performed, you have to figure out if it's being done by a, a person or by a thing. If it's a person, you need to use the preposition a or ab, and that's an ablative of agent. If it's not a person, you can just use a bare ablative without any kind of preposition. And so that's an ablative of means. So a river is an inanimate object. So we don't need the preposition a or ab here. We don't need to say a flumine by a river. All we need is just a bare ablative, just flumine, because it's an inanimate object. And so that's an ablative of means. Okay, so straight ablative. If it's an inanimate object, but you get ah or ab if it's a person. So it is bounded by the Garonne River. And now Caesar's going to tell us two more things that form the borders of this particular section of Gaul. Next we have Okeano. What does that mean? The ancient Greeks and Romans did not know about the Americas. They did not know that the Americas existed. They thought that once you got to the Atlantic Ocean, that that was a giant river that goes all around the earth, and they called it ocean. They viewed the earth as kind of a big round thing with this circular ocean going all around it. So that's why he doesn't call it the ocean or, you know, the Atlantic Ocean. He just calls it ocean. So as you look at your map, notice that uh, you have the Garonne River forming part of the border there between the main central part of Gaul and Aquitania. But then as you go north, the western border is really just the Atlantic Ocean. So he says it is bounded by the Garonne River by ocean. So he doesn't put in the word and here. He could say Garumna Flumine et Okeano et blah, blah, blah. In Greek and Latin literature, when you think that they ought to be using a conjunction such as and, but they don't use the conjunction, they just sort of pack words together, we call that asyndeton. 
in my mind, this is an example of a syndeton where you could use a conjunction, but there isn't one. The word a syndeton is comprised of three different parts. The de part in a syndeton, that's in the third syllable. The de part there comes from a Greek word that means to bind or tie. And then syn, that part comes from the Greek word that means together. So syn and de means to tie or bind together. And then the letter a on the front, a, that negates it. So literally a syndeton, that's spelled a s y n d e t o n. The word a syndeton means not tied together. In other words, it means there's no conjunction there. The word conjunction is the Latin version of Greek syndeton. Con means together. Jungo means join. So con jungo or conjunct means join together. In Greek, it's sun de. Okay, those are the root words there. So the word asyndeton just means no conjunction. In English here, we might say it's bounded by the Garumna River and by the ocean and by, you know, blah, 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 whatever comes next. We might at least put the word and in there someplace, but we don't have that here. So for me, this is an example of asyndeton. So in your translation, you can throw in the word and just to smooth it out a bit. Okay, so it's bounded by the Garonne River and by ocean and by Finibus Belgarum. Finis is a third declension noun that means border. Here it's ablative plural, so it means the borders, and it's ablative of means, so it's by the borders. And then Belgarum means of the Belgae, that's genitive plural. So literally, by the boundaries or by the borders of the Belgians. But when we see the word finis in the plural, we can translate it as territory, as a collective. Instead of saying by the borders of somebody, you can say by the territory of somebody. So finibus belgarum will say by the territory of the Belgians. Again, finibus is ablative of means. So this sentence altogether says, it is bounded by the Garumna River, by ocean, and by the territory of the Belgians. Again, we have a syndeton there. So between the word ocean and finibus, I threw in the word and. Let's move on to the next sentence. Atinget etiam ab sequanis et helvetiis flumen renum. The main verb here is atinget. As you can see from the footnote, that means borders on. It's really the verb tango, which means to touch. So tango with the preposition odd. So it's really odd tango. But when you put the preposition odd there on the front, something called assimilation happens. The D gets absorbed into the sound of the T. So the D turns into a T and odd tango turns into at tango. And then as happens often with compounded verbs, verbs that are compounded with a preposition, you get a vowel change. So the A in tango turns into an I. And so you get atingit. So literally, the etymology means to touch. Here it's something like, you know, to be adjacent to or to border on. We'll translate etiam as even, like it even borders on. And what does it border on? Flumen renum. That's the Rhine River. Throughout history, the Rhine River has been considered to be the natural border between the French and the Germans, between France and Germany. So the subject here is not stated. There's no separate word to be the subject. We're still talking about that main middle section of Gaul that was referred to previously. So we can say that the word it is the subject here. It and then atingit. Uh, that means it borders on. And then the direct object of atingit is flumen. It borders on the river. Those are the subject, verb, and direct object here in this part of the sentence. And flumen has random along with it. So it borders on the 
Rhine River. As you look at your map, cast your gaze from the southwestern part of France up to the northeastern part. Go all the way to the part where uh, near the top of the map it says Belgai, and then go a bit further to the east where it says Germani, and you'll see the Rhine River there. So the big section of Gaul being talked about here cuts a wide swath through Gaul. It's really the main section, the main large middle section of Gaul, comprising the majority of what today would be France. Sequanis and Helvetiis are both ablative plural objects of the preposition ab. As I mentioned before, there's some flexibility with the way they use ab here. Ab here means something like on the side of, as you can see in footnote four. So on the side of the sequani and the helwetii. So this section of the reading, this uh, little sentence here, it says, it even borders on the Rhine River on the side of the Sequani and Helwetii. So if you look at the map, you'll see that the Sequani and the Helwetii are over there on the eastern side of Gaul near the Rhine River. So he's using the Sequani and the Helwetii as a point of reference to tell you where the Rhine is, to tell you where that eastern border is. The next few words here say, Werget ad septentriones. The word septentriones here is the Latin way to say north. Okay, it's the Roman word for north. The etymology of this word is interesting. From what I have been told, it's really a constellation in the sky called, well, in North America, we call it the Big Dipper. I think in Great Britain, they call it the Wain, W-A-I-N. But this word here, septentriones, it's really the word septem, S-E-P-T-E-M, which means seven. And then from what I've been told, triones, that means something like plow oxen. So it literally means the seven plow oxen. It's some archaic term referring to a constellation that's in the north. So literally, ad septentriones says toward the seven plow oxen, but we just translate it as to the north. And wergit means something like it faces or it inclines. Okay, wergit is third person singular. And I think that what's happening here, I'm not sure about this, but I think wergit means that if you're in Rome and you want to face toward this part of Gaul, you would face toward the north. You could translate wergit ad septentriones as it inclines to the north, it faces to the north. But I think what it's really saying is that it lies to the north, that from the Roman's perspective, it is to the north. So in my translation here, I'm saying it lies to the north. Okay, let's take the next section here. Belgae ab extremis Galliae finibus oriuntur. Okay, so we're moving on now from talking about the main middle section of Gaul, the largest section, to the Belgians. We've left the middle part, and now Caesar's telling us about a smaller section in the northeast, or perhaps the far north, and that's the area inhabited by the Belgians. So the subject here is Belgae, that means the Belgic tribesmen, and the verb here is orientur. That particular verb looks passive because it has the passive N-T-U-R ending on it, but as you can see from footnote 7, it's a passive form with active meaning. This is a special kind of verb called a deponent verb. Deponent verbs look passive, but you translate them as active. You may have noticed that there are a couple of grammatical things here in today's reading that we haven't covered yet. And that's one of the challenges of introducing students to undiluted Latin literature. When you're reading actual Latin literature that has not been simplified, you're going to just see all kinds of different things. So the authors of the book are trying to strike a balance between giving you something that they've covered a lot of, but also guiding you through the things you haven't covered yet. 
by giving you footnotes. So most of what's here, you've already covered, but they have some footnotes here explaining the things that you don't know yet, the things that you have not studied yet. So just do the best you can. And of course, when this entire Linney's Latin class is finished, you'll have the knowledge you need to go back and read all this and you'll understand everything. You know, when you're a student, it's good to go back and reread texts and study them again to uh, review all the grammar. So it's not a perfect system, but you have to start somewhere. You have to start with some kind of something to get into real Latin literature. So orientor means they rise. That is third person plural. So the subject here is Belgae and the verb is orientor. So the Belgians rise, or as you can see in footnote seven, we can also translate it as begin. So the Belgians rise or the Belgians begin. And then again, we have the preposition ob. As I mentioned before, there's some flexibility with how we can translate the word ob. Generally, we translate it as from. So we could say, literally, the Belgians rise from extremis Galliae finibus. But probably at is a better way to do it. Uh, you can see that in footnote five, that's what they're telling us to do. And so uh, finibus really is the object of the preposition ab. Finibus means territory. It's really the third declension noun finis in the ablative plural. So ab finibus makes a prepositional phrase. Extremis is an adjective modifying finibus. As you can see in footnote six, that means farthest. And then Galliae is genitive singular. It means of Gaul. As we've seen before, we have a possessive genitive wedged in between a noun and its adjective, sort of a sandwich structure. So this whole section here says, the Belgians rise at the farthest territory of Gaul, or the Belgians begin at the farthest territory of Gaul, something like that. And if you look at a map, you'll see that the Belgians really are at the very top of Gaul. There's nothing north of that except the English Channel. If you go any further, you fall into the water. So the Belgians are about as far north as you can get. If you went further to the northeast, you would go into what today I suppose is the Netherlands or Germany. Let's keep moving ahead. The next section here says, Pertinent ad inferiorem partem fluminis reini. Okay, pertinent is the verb. That's a form of the verb pertineo, which means to extend. It's third person plural. The subject here is unstated. There's no explicitly stated subject. So we're just reusing the subject from the previous sentence, which is belgae. So Belgae is the unstated subject, pertinent is the verb. So the Belgians extend. That's what we have here as our subject and verb. Then we have a prepositional phrase, ad inferiorem partem. Inferiorem means lower. So ad inferiorem partem says to the lower part. And then fluminus reini says of the Rhine River. Okay, fluminus is genitive singular, reini is genitive singular along with fluminous. So this isn't too hard, uh, this sentence here. Again, it says, they extend, uh, they meaning the Belgians, they extend to the lower part of the Rhine River. So if you look at your map and look at where the Belgians are, they're not just up there at the very top. Their territory extends downward a bit along the western side of the Rhine River. So that's what Caesar is saying here is they extend downward some to the south, not just up there near the English Channel. Moving on, spectant in septentrionem et orientem solem. Here we get more directions. As I mentioned before, septentriones, that word literally is referring to a constellation. It's the seven plow oxen or something like that. That's the Roman name for a constellation. I believe it's the same one we call the Big Dipper. 
So here we have the expression in septentrionem, that means to the north. For some reason here it's singular, whereas before it was plural. Before it was ad septentriones, now it's in septentrionem. Your guess is as good as mine for why it was plural before and now it's singular. So in septentrionem, we'll say something like into the north. Remember that when in takes the accusative case, it can mean into. It can also mean against, but here I think it means into. Also, we have the word for sun here, S-U-N. That's the word solem. You can see footnote nine says sol solus is a third declension noun that means sun. That's where we get English words like solar. If something is solar, it's related to the sun. So sol is nominative singular. Solus is genitive singular. Solem is accusative singular. Why is it accusative singular? Because it's the object of the preposition in. So in septentrionum says into the north, and in solem, literally into the sun. What kind of sun? The orientem solem. The word orientem is a present participle. As you can see in footnote 7, we have oriens as the present participle of orior. So oriens means rising. That's nominative singular. So the genitive singular form would be orientis. Accusative singular would be orientem. Remember a few lessons ago when we studied present participles. So orientem and solem are both accusative singular. And so it means rising sun. So this phrase here, in septentrionem, et orientem solum, literally it says, into the seven plow oxen and into the rising sun. So that's the Roman way to say to the northeast, because in septentrionem says to the north, and in orientem solum says into the rising sun. That means east. So if you put them together and say into the north and east, that's their way of saying northeast. So our verb here is spectant. That's the verb specto. For those of you who have read my book, uh, Getting Started with Latin, you know that verb already. Specto means to watch. Specto spectare, spectavi, spectatum. It's a first conjugation verb. Here they're translating it as face in the sense of it looks in that direction. So this section here says, they face to the north and east. Who's the they? It's the Belgians. What I think is happening here is that Caesar is not saying that the Belgians stand there facing to the north and east. That's not what he's saying. I think what he's saying is that if you're back in Italy, in Rome, the Belgians are in that direction from where you are. So if you're in Rome, the Belgians are to the northeast. So in the first part of this reading, Caesar told us about the main middle section of Gaul. Now he's told us about the Belgians to the northeast. Now only one part left, and that's Aquitania. So this last sentence or two is dedicated to Aquitania, which is down in the far bottom, the southwest corner of France. So let's read this last part here. Aquitania agarumna flumine ad Pyrenaeos montes et eam partem oceani quae est ad Hispaniam pertinet. The subject here is Aquitania. That's the very first word. That's the sector of Gaul. That's to the southwest. You can see that that's the part below the Garonne River. And then the verb here is pertinet. Again, that's a form of the verb pertineo, which means to extend or pertain to, or it can also mean to have to do with something. So the main subject and verb here will say, Aquitania extends. We have a relative clause here, quae est ad hispaniam. So let's save that for later and tackle the main clause first. Again, the subject and verb, Aquitania extends. And then we have a prepositional phrase, a garumna flumine. That means from the Garumna River, 
or to use the modern name, from the Garon River. And then we have Ad Pyrenaios. That means to the Pyrenees. So we have the, the word Pyrenees and then the word Montes, which means mountains. That's the third declension noun, Mons Montes. Okay, so M-O-N-T is the genitive stem. So Montes is accusative plural, along with Pyrenaios. So Ad Pyrenaios Montes says to the Pyrenees Mountains. Now the Pyrenees Mountains are right on the border between France and Spain. So when he says that Aquitania extends from the Garonne to the Pyrenees, he's saying that it extends south from the Garonne down to the Pyrenees. So it's in the extreme southwest corner of France. Okay, so if you're looking at your map, you'll see that Aquitania is below the Garonne River. The preposition odd here has two objects. Not only is it the Pyrenees Mountains, but odd also goes along with aeom partem. Partem is the accusative singular form of parse, which means part. And aeom is a form of is, ea, id. Notice that it's accusative along with partem. So we could translate aeom partem as this part or that part. It would probably sound smoother in English to say that part. And then we have okeani, which is the genitive singular form of ocean. And that's possessing partem. So it says to that part of ocean. Okay, so what we have so far without the relative clause says this. Aquitania extends from the Garumna River to the Pyrenees Mountains and to that part of ocean. Okay, we're going to reuse the preposition odd because that also goes along with aeom and partem. Okay, so now we have a relative clause starting with quai. We'll translate quai as which. So it's that part of ocean, which. And then the relative clause tells us more about that part of it. Quai est ad hispaniam. That's the relative clause. Quai is the relative pronoun. Partem is the antecedent of quai. Quai is singular because its antecedent partem is singular. Quai is feminine because its antecedent partem is feminine. But quai is nominative because of the role it plays in the relative clause. And the role it plays is that of subject. Quai is the subject of the verb est. So we'll translate quai and est as which is. We have a prepositional phrase here, ad hispaniam. Hispania is the Latin word for Spain. Here it's accusative singular because it's the object of the preposition ad. We could translate ad hispaniam as toward Spain, but you can also translate ad as other things like at or near. So it might be good to translate it as something like near. So quae est ad hispaniam could say something like, which is near Spain. So this whole sentence here says, Aquitania extends from the Garumna River to the Pyrenees Mountains and to that part of ocean which is near Spain. So if you look at your map, you'll see what he's talking about. The western border of Aquitania is the Atlantic Ocean. And so it's ad hispaniam in the sense that it's toward Spain or near Spain. Okay, one last line to go. Spectat inter ocasum solis et septentriones. So the subject here is Aquitania, which we're reusing from the previous sentence. And the verb here is spectat. That's third person singular. It means he, she, or it watches. He, she, or it faces. Okay, so the subject and verb here is it faces or it watches, uh, with the it being Aquitania. Now we have a prepositional phrase, inter ocasum. Inter is a preposition that means between. It takes the accusative case. And ocasum is a noun from the fourth declension. We haven't studied that declension yet, so just take my word for it. 
Ocasum means the setting. Ocasum is accusative. So inter ocasum says between the setting. And then solus is genitive singular of the word sol, which means sun. So inter ocasum solus, between the setting of the sun. And then et means and. And then septentriones is another object of the preposition inter. And of course, that means north. So this little prepositional phrase here says, between the setting of the sun and the north. Or in other words, between the west and the north, because where does the sun set? In the west. So what's between the west and the north? Northwest. Again, spectat, I don't think it means that the country faces the northwest. I think what it means is that from the perspective of a Roman, it lies to the northwest. That seems to be what Caesar is saying. Here on this line, he uses the term inter, between, whereas on line seven, he didn't. On line seven, he just said it faces into the north and the east. Of course, the territory of the Belgians does not lie to the east of the Romans. It doesn't lie to the east of much of anything. So it's hard to see how he could be saying it extends to the east there. So it seems to me like on line seven, he's also saying that it's between the north and the east in the sense of northeast, although he doesn't use the word inter there. However, on line 10, the final line, he says inter ocasum solus et septentriones. So that's between the west and the north, seemingly referring to the northwest. Again, As Hans Friedrich Mueller's book says, the geography here is a bit vague, but definitely using a map as you read is very helpful. No matter how vague the text is, just following along with a map is extremely helpful for visualizing the geography that he's talking about and comparing the text to the map. It's very, very helpful, and it'll help you also as we go into future readings, and especially if you continue reading Caesar's Gallic Wars on your own, I highly, strongly recommend having a map on hand as you read. That will be very helpful because lots and lots of places and rivers are mentioned. Okay, that does it for this lesson. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next time in Lesson 34.